everyone. Uh, my name is Sonia Subramanian, and I'm a software engineer at Google. It's my distinct honor and privilege to welcome Dr. Chris Wiggins, Associate Professor of Applied Mathematics at Columbia University, and Dr. Matthew L. Jones from the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, also at Columbia University, to talk at Google. They plan to talk to us about their book, How Data Happened, a history from the age of reason to the age of algorithms that I read over the last couple of weeks. It was incredibly insightful to me as an engineer and helped me gain a whole new perspective. Big data is an extremely relevant subject in our times. How we got to where we are is a fascinating journey and helps us understand the complexities in handling big data today. In the next 45 minutes, they will take us through this journey and its relevance to the present day. I'm sure you will have a lot of questions during the talk. Please add them to the chat and we will get to as many as we can. With that, let's welcome Dr. Wiggins and Dr. Jones. Thanks so much for having us. Thank you, Sonia. Of course, our pleasure. Uh, so uh, if perhaps maybe we can get started if you're ready. That's great. Uh, so uh, to start with, would you be able to give us an overview of your book and tell us what prompted you to write it? Um, well, I mean, the several things came together to lead to the book. And, and Matt, I've had the pleasure of knowing for a decade now and working with in a variety of, of contexts. I'd say the main thing that really led to the book was eventually creating this class together. So back in 2015, Matt and I started talking about creating a class, maybe on just history of data science. Um, and it was really led by conversations with students at the time, thanks to Matt um, being a, a great advisor to many students. Uh, and once we started teaching the class, it became clear that maybe there was a there was a book here, including that there was material that would be new to students coming from a, a humanistic background. And, and also, Sonia, I'm glad to hear you say that some of the material was interesting to you as an engineer. Oh, you know, yes, very for, interesting. For my fellow technologists, I felt like there was stuff that for me would have been a non-technical digression in my technical classes, but we felt like there was stuff that would be exciting to engineers as well as to people coming from different backgrounds. Matt, maybe you can elaborate on, on how the, how it all came to be. Yeah, well, I mean, the book as a whole wants to get across both the excitement of, you know, the, the use of data to investigate the human condition, the world, the environment, uh, nature, but also the challenges associated with that. And so we cover about a 200 year span um, yes. The idea to, to illuminate the kind of political and ethical challenges we are all facing and increasingly aware of are not entirely new um, and to capture that. And so uh, we could talk about lots of the details there. Um, and the class really came uh, and, and then the book became at an intersection of really wanting to bring together students who are more technically oriented engineers uh, like uh, you and, and, and Chris um, and more humanistic students and to give them both the kinds of knowledge, to share the kind of knowledges. We really want to get that intersection across in a way that I think people will find exciting and challenging. Oh, that's great to hear. Uh, so uh, would you be able to give us uh, a progression of the collection and processing of data and the important milestones along the way that you discuss in the book? I found that very interesting and uh, maybe it would be great to share that with the audience. So at a, at a high level, we break the book into three parts. Part one is sort of about the way we use data, um, largely on pencil and paper, to make sense of what we think is true. Part two begins at Bletchley Park. It begins with the creation of digital computation uh, and the way that making sense of data became uh, computational, but also involved hardware. Uh, and suddenly that brings together a lot of diverse communities and elements and technical skills. It's not just a pencil and paper exercise to understand what is true. It also involves the um, integration of industrial scale make data processing. Part three is really about our, our present day and is not so much attempting to look at things chronologically, but trying to understand our current milieu, um, including the, the rise of, of corporate use of data and an understanding of the various powers that constrain and guide data empowered algorithms in our everyday lives. Yeah, and we very much wanted all along the way for people to see that 
the collection of data always involved sort of a vision that the world was something that could be understood largely in uh, um, numerical terms, and that it needed infrastructures of collection, initially paper, nowadays, you know, large scale servers. It also required labor all along. And so these are continuous, even though they, they take much greater scale in our own time. But analytically, when we're thinking about this process, we always need to attend to that. Um, and so we want to show that continuity, as well as how there's such a radical transformation in the Second World War, and then with the advent. Of, of the internet in the 1990s. So on that note, uh, so the book mentions that uh, when collecting data for decision making, there can sometimes be blind spots, if I understand correctly, where only some facets of data are collected. Uh, so would you be able to tell us a little bit more and their consequences as you discuss in the book? I think you mentioned World War II and genocide and stuff like that. Uh, we'd, we'd love to hear your thoughts on that. There certainly are some chapters on um, what Stephen Jay Gould called scientific racism and the politics of even uh, just collection of data themselves. So, so we have this idea that there's an opportunity for societal harms or perhaps bias in you know deploying a, a data empowered algorithm, or maybe even the model itself. One of the things we investigate in the early chapter, and again we we stand on the shoulders of giants like Stephen Jay Gould here is to point out that even just deciding what data are collected and what data are not collected can be a place at which we um, shape uh, eventual understandings of what's true in, in a way that um, can impose our particular worldview in a way that is then sort of recreated by the data. The danger there is that because now we have numbers, we somehow imbue it with objectivity, forgetting about the subjective design choices that we made when we were deciding what data would be collected and what and what not to be collected. Yeah, and an example we give is there was a big fight between uh, a, a kind of a, a man who was working for the insurance industry and the great American sociologist Du Bois. And it was about analysis of data about the insurability of, of blacks and white in, in the United States at the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century. And they took really two radically different opposing views of what the significance of the data had been collected. For the insurance guy, Hoffman, the point was that it showed that there was something essentially wrong with one group of people. For Du Bois, he said that this data was very powerful in showing that there was historical causes of stratification, and that that was to be understood. So there's both questions of, of, of course, of collection, but also of jumping too quickly from taking that data and then giving it kind of internal truthiness, as uh, Chris might say. Oh, thank you for that. Uh, so uh, also chapter six discusses the importance of Bayes' theorem in cryptography and code breaking during World War II. And there's a statement that I found very interesting. Uh, being philosophical about Bayes is very different from using the formula known as Bayes' rule. And I think a lot of us are very familiar with Bayes' rule. Uh, would you uh, elaborate on that and uh, you know, give, uh, tell us what that means in the context of big data and uh, generally your thoughts? So we, we try not to get too mathy in the book, but yes, there is, there is an actual use of, of Bayes' theorem for computing log odds. So w what I'm trying to get at, at with that example, and maybe I'll try to, 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 to be concrete with an example here, is we go through this example of COVID diagnosis. So imagine that you know the sensitivity and specificity of a COVID test. You know those data and you know some result. Like let's say that I take a bunch of tests and I've scored negative on my PCR, positive on my antigen. I know all the sensitivities and specificities. That's not what I really want. What I really want to know is what's the probability that I'm sick given all the data I have? And the sensitivity and the specificity actually give you the probability of you scoring a result given what is true. So it's hard not to be philosophical when you're using Bayes' rule for statistics because you're always inverting this, this statement about the probability that I get some data given the model. But what I really want to know is the probability of the model. I want to use my data in order to you know, advance my understanding of the world and know what, what the new truth is in the presence of these data. So that's a philosophical um, use case. And it, and it becomes philosophical because often we don't have prior probability of the hypothesis, which is just which what Bayes' rule is getting at, if you don't mind me getting too technical here. No, no, um, not at all. OK, so, so yeah, so Bletchley Park is, is a nice place to reintroduce Bayes' rule, although Bayes' rule is far, far older, uh, in part because some of the analysis they were doing was using Bayes' rule. 
in part because the problem was so very applied that they didn't really have time to debate philosophy. You know, they needed to break a set of codes by the end of the day in order to be useful for the the, uh, the code the code um, mm -hmm. to change every day. Um, but also because it's one of several examples of the book where the community of people trying to make sense of data was disparate. It's not like there was one group of people over the last 300 years that were trying to make sense of data. The way we make sense of data today is informed by statisticians, natural scientists, computer scientists, and also a lot of different interests, you know, code breaking, developing products, trying to make sense of what's true, mm -hmm. trying to preserve the greatness of the Victorian, the Victorian empire, which features prominently in part one of the class. So part, that, that story is, is partly um, a good example of how the way we make sense of data today, we all make sense of data today, is informed by so many disparate communities with so many different interests and so many disparate ideas about what is the method that's going to win the day. And one of the things we discovered, um, we found a, a sort of cache of papers that the NSA had declassified showing its own attitudes towards Bayes had, had developed. And those were in stark contradiction to what was most popular among, at that time, philosophers and mathematical statisticians. It was a very practical use of Bayes. And that slowly disseminated out to become uh, one of the major ways that people uh, do all kinds of computational statistics and data analysis today. So there's a sort of direct line between the transformation of attitudes around mass data analysis uh, in cryptography towards the quotidian, the everyday use of Bayes today. Awesome. Thank you for that. Uh, would you be able to talk a little bit about the term social physics, uh, what that means as mentioned in the book, and how is that relevant today? So one of the first figures we look at is a Belgian statistician whose, whose most famous concept is better known than his name. He's responsible for the body mass index, and his name was Ketley. Um, and he was working in Belgium right in the wake of the French Revolution, so the upturning of the European order. And he uh, was extremely interested in how the new data that was being collected by states might be analyzed using the new tools that had um, uh, been developed for physics uh, in the 18th century. So there was a huge prestige associated with Newtonian physics for good reason. Now, when he applied these to data about human beings, what he came to argue is that they often followed patterns that are now very familiar to us, like the normal curve. And he came mm -hmm. to argue that there was this existence of, that there, there were phenomena, there were social phenomena that we could characterize as physics with their own mechanics, their own dynamics, that we could use both to characterize human activity, like um, rates of divorce or rates of, of, of criminality, um, that we could use to characterize and subtly change. So it was something Thing that was mm -hmm. not just about individual choice, but like much of 19th century physics, was concerned with the groupings, not of particles, but of people. Very interesting. Uh, so uh, I think uh, data collection, you talk about data collection correlating and inferring causal relationships uh, in great detail. Uh, so would you be able to explain for us the progression there a little bit more? Well, we certainly spent some time on Adne Yule. So, so we, we, we try to give people an understanding of why you can have things that are, you can have models that are very predictive and yet will not give you a causal understanding of what would happen if you were to go in and change a system. So it's, it's useful to be able to take an old example. So we, we use Adne Yule for that purpose. So Adne Yule is an engineer and statistician from the late 19th century who wrote this paper called um, On the Causes of pauperism in England, so on the causes of poverty in England. He puts it right in the title, but he's going to look at causes. What he actually does is a little piece of supervised learning. What he actually does is a little multivariate regression. He infers uh, three or four parameters from the data, linear ordinary least squares. You, you, would, you can do it to you know, freshman class now in, in scikit-learn, which we actually do in the lab of our class. But he infers that because the coefficient that relates how many people are receiving welfare to how many poor people there are in different regions of England, because that coefficient is positive, he says, therefore I have revealed that giving people help causes poverty. A deeply political statement to infer from the sign of one of the coefficients in a, a, a little tiny yeah. multivariate regression. So it's, it's, a, it's a real excellent example of how correlation and causation get conflated. 
Um, and then we spend some time thinking about, well, why is that? Well, it's because causation does cause correlation. So it's reasonable to conflate them. And it's a great example because he himself had some amount of reflexivity. He knew what he was doing. You know that he knew that he was doing because in footnote 25, he writes, strictly speaking for causation should be read as is associated with. So he knew he was pulling a fast, fast one over the readers or his fellow members of the Royal Society. So um, it's a useful example because it's so far removed that we can sort of look at it um, in the abstract and not conflate it with our own concerns of the day. But we should remember that just because we have a model that makes excellent predictions on held out data doesn't mean that we've said anything causal about what would happen if we went and changed the way that this covariate is related to this other covariate. And we may not be able to say anything about what would happen to the eventual uh, label that we're trying to impute. All of that involves some extra modeling and some extra subjectivity, irrespective of how excellent our AUC is. We can, we can get statistically excellent predictive models. It doesn't mean that we've said something about what will happen causally. Well, that's uh, that's really good to hear. Uh, so uh, also, I think uh, you talk about uh, the different branches of thought related to formulating hypotheses and how they evolve to the processes of the present day. So uh, I think uh, I don't know if that's related to the previous question about causation, and but uh, it would be great to get your thoughts on that as well. Yeah, one of the stories we want to tell is uh, before the explosion of large data captured and information infrastructures uh, came to be the prestige of the reorganization of science around significance testing. Um, that's familiar to everyone and that I think probably most of this audience knows is in a bit of a mode of crisis. Um, and so we wanted, to, we wanted to explain the genesis of that. Um, and it emerges at, at, at the intersection of people with sort of radically different ideas about what it is that you want out of the use of, of, of statistics on actually small sets of data. Um, and initially, uh, one form of it emerges out of the, the, Guinness, the Guinness Corporation, the beer making corporation, um, and a figure no, known as William Gossett, who really is interested in how, how are you going to set up uh, uh, experiments, say with barley or hops or other sorts of of things in an economical way in order to sort of be able to discover what is going to make the most stable, best tasting, uh, best kind of beer. And this gets transformed in different the hands of different figures, um, which will be familiar to people who've done a lot of statistics, but in the hands of uh, the, the, the British statistician Fisher, it really becomes a replacement theory for what is scientific truth. Um, and a radical notion of randomization in trials. And he, he, along the way, hazards that many scientists will want a significance test its 120th, which later is going to become hardened in ways that he was horrified by uh, as a p-value of, of less than 0.05. Um, in the hands of uh, his, his, his Polish, then U.S. immigrant rival, Jerzy Neyman, it becomes rather a decision theory, that it's a way of acting practically. These two schools of thought. Um, they engage in warfare for decades, warfare that to all but so the cognoscenti seem uh, really sort of beyond the pale, but are radically different worldviews. But for our purposes, most of those differences get flattened out and put into a textbook form of science that then, then proliferates and becomes the heart of much of what we take of as the procedures in, in whatever you want, agricultural science, psychology, uh, uh, biology, and, and, and elsewhere uh, to this day. And it's a radically different vision of what statistics can do than what happens in the explosion of, of, of machine learning and, and, and the data sciences in the last three decades. So uh, I, I remember reading that uh, those have evolved into different uh, fields of today. Uh, if I remember correctly, one was statistics and one was, you know, uh, uh, applied. One is applied and one is uh, completely theoretical. Uh, could you, uh, hi, you know, explain to us a little bit more there? Well, we try to talk quite a bit about field making in general. So throughout several chapters, we talk about how artificial intelligence became a field, how machine learning became yes. a field. And part of that is a story about how mathematical statistics became a field. Even just putting in the adjective mathematical, right, is to distinguish it from statistics of some other court, some other sort that already existed. Mathematical statistics as an act that you see in academic departments is very different than the sort of professionalized way that it became made algorithmic and, and has this role in, in truth-making um, around 
hypothesis testing. And that's the way that many people encounter statistics. So if you if you encounter statistics because you were majoring in psychology or or, or biology uh, or you know some other field, you might encounter statistics only via this this construct of collecting data, writing a confidence interval, computing your p-value, and then seeing if it's less than 0.05. If so, true. And then you move on to the next hypothesis. And that sort of um, algorithmic approach to statistics, as, as Matt mentioned, would have been anathema both to Fisher and to Neyman, who hated each other's guts, by the way, and had completely, had completely different ways of understanding how we were supposed to make sense of of data. Uh, and I'll inject one more thing. For both of them, they hated each other and they had all sorts of really colorful insults in the academic literature. But for both of them, there was no bigger insult than to say that you were Bayesian, just to get back to chapter six. You know, that's a whole other way of trying to make sense of data. That's uh, interesting and a little funny. Uh, so uh, to the next question, uh, the book describes an early view uh, of human intelligence and what it comprises of. Uh, you say that uh, great human capacities like speaking a natural language or doing advanced mathematics could never emerge from experience. That required far more. To focus only on data was to misunderstand human spontaneity and intelligence. Uh, would you please like uh, discuss that a little more, especially in the age of NLPs? And uh, you know, uh, does that uh, still does that view still hold? Uh, uh, how would we uh, relate to that now? Yeah, so that's one of the you know bringing up NLP is exactly uh, at some level the point um, that there was. The, the the initial explosion and blossoming around uh, the what was called artificial intelligence um, really was focused on a vision of human intelligence that was not about the accumulation of data, that wasn't about sensory input. And in fact, those who advocated that were often anathema to the people who branded themselves as artificial intelligence. So it really was a deeply anti-empirical approach. And it seems so peculiar given our current vision of artificial intelligence. And in the case of something like language, we don't really get into this in the book, but there's a sort of massive movement in the middle of the 20th century to show that accounts of language as being purely learned, uh, but the, the sort of behaviorist account of learning is on attack on all fronts, um, particularly by people like Noam Chomsky and others. AI uh, was part of this movement. And that what was needed to be understood to be understand human intelligence was really things like mathematical ability or chess playing or a very a sort of high level logical activity. Now, um, one of the interesting things we like to point out is that Turing himself, who wrote this really important mm -hmm. early paper, had a much more capacious vision a vision that actually admitted uh, a wide range of human competencies, including the things he himself was so brilliant at, logic and uh, uh, mathematics and chess and this sort of stuff, but that could involve this whole sort of sensuous world. Um, and one of the key tales to understand how we get to today is how artificial intelligence radically is changed um, as a descriptor uh, to be a descriptor of rather the world of data analysis, of, uh, of a vision of language that isn't going to be comprised of a small number of rules, um, but rather of uh, incredibly large uh, data models. And there's, yeah, there's a paper uh, famously by three Google researchers called um, oh, The Unbelievable Effectiveness of, uh, of Data, which stated this, that, that language was unlikely to look like the, the rules of physics, but was rather going to look a lot like an empirical science. Um, and that was a complete inversion of these mid-century views that dominated um, well into the, in, into the 1990s. Oh, thank you for that. Uh, so I guess the next topic would be data privacy. Uh, and I was, uh, you know, that, uh, that part was pretty interesting to me. And uh, maybe I should start with uh, what exactly individualistic understanding of privacy as you describe in the book means. So there we were looking at uh, changes in the way people argued about privacy. Uh, from the 1970s uh, up until the sort of the 2000s. And in the early 1970s, there was a vibrant conversation in the United States, a bipartisan conversation about data privacy. And the way it plays out um, is that essentially privacy laws are enacted that constrain the US federal government, um, but don't really con constrain com uh, uh, either sort of non-governmental actors or especially corporations. Um, and instead, what emerges is a, a vision of privacy is largely something that 
is you're, you're concerned about your own privacy rather than your privacy being a kind of uh, ecological concept, something that involves you, but also many uh, other sorts of okay. people. And what it one of the things it contributes to is thinking that the danger is largely the, the federal government um, infringing on your privacy, but the other is a conception of the way to practice your, the way you're going to protect your privacy is individual action. So, for example, opting out of cookies in your browser uh, mm -hmm. as a solution to questions of privacy, rather than it being a uh, a, a, a much richer conception of what privacy is and the ways to protect it. Uh, so would you uh, give us your ideas on what are the main concerns today uh, with regards to data privacy and how we can address those? Well, uh, one of the things we talked about in the 13th chapter, the final chapter, is about the way that power and checks and balances are distributed between individual decisions, corporations, and the state and the state of course could be u.s federal government but it could be local municipalities or foreign governments as well so that's one of the things that i think is going to be interesting to trace out over the next few years is let's say in the case of, of foreign uh, states like many of these companies are multinational companies or rather they act they're active in in different uh, jurisdictions and so the changes in privacy enacted by say the eu can have an order one impact even on american users because these companies are active all over the globe. So for each of those regulations, they need to be distilled from principles down to standards, rules, and eventually lines of code and product decisions. That's where things involve um, the actions of individual you know, product owners and software engineers. And so we spend a lot of time talking about the ways that individuals do have outsized impact in these corporations via their own private ordering. You know, in some ways, as individuals, they enact an ordering in the same way that a state enacts an ordering. We also spend some time on the subject of privacy about corporate power in the way that corporations, in addition to the obvious power they have by creating products we all use, effectively can deplatform each other uh, when one company changes its policy in a way that can have a huge impact on the access of a company to reach users, or the ability of a company to monetize in different ways. So there's a lot of, uh, let's say, unresolved contests among those three powers. We refer to it as a, an unstable three-player game between corporate power, state power, and individual power. Yes, I remember that. Um, so I guess uh, one of my uh, major questions was, what, what do you, where do you see data science and machine learning? Uh, what problems do you see them address in the coming decade? What do you like? You know, what is your vision, or what? How do you see uh, this uh, journey going forward? So things I'm excited about include uh, causality as a field, which in, in part I think is exciting because it yeah. does explicitly involve so many modeling assumptions. Um, the other, another thing that's exciting, obviously, today is the continued progress of deep learning, large language models, or more generally, methods that are extremely performant and yet completely uninterpretable, and we have barely any theory for why they work. Again, I, I, I put why they work in scare quotes because understanding can mean different things to different scientists. So a mathematical understanding of, of, of learning is different from the statistician's understanding of learning, which is different from, I don't know, the PAC framework or a, a computational learning theory understanding of why learning works. So I'm excited to see these methods, which are so deeply performant, eventually become theory, eventually become uh, a, a place where we understand uh, why these methods are so performant. And although maybe it's a little pedestrian to say I'm excited about a particular application of data, I remain excited about health as a, as a particular yeah. arena for data. It's um, it's got a, just an incredible wealth of people, process, and technology problems. You know, how do you get access to data in a way that's privacy preserving? How do you deal yes. with the United States lock on a few different um, corporations, which are um, so su successfully controlling access to data? How do you actually do the machine learning tasks in a way that meets challenges of population stratification and causality and, and everything else? And ultimately, how do you make people's lives better using health data? I mean, it's it's a, yes. it's a challenge that's been around for decades, but it's it's clearly is not solved yet. So, that's something something else that I'm hoping data scientists continue to make progress on. Yeah, I'm less uh, you know equipped to answer this question in certain ways, but I'll say two things that I'm excited to see is one um, on the subject of large language models. I think 
right now, of course, there's a yes. major discussion about, oh, where does this fit in with artificial general intelligence? Um, I think ultimately what we're going to see is that it th they're going to offer not some substitute for human intelligence, but really part of a whole range of different ways of thinking about intelligence in the natural and artificial world. Um, and so it's going to be a, 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 an interesting domain for all kinds of exploration um, that is more sophisticated, I think, a lot of the conversation. The other thing, um, coming back to the kind of use cases that uh, Chris is talking about, I think the more that the data science uh, that we develop um, is integrated with the kind of communities it affects, whether those are some scientific communities that are collaborating with data scientists with content-based knowledge, or when we're building, uh, you know, data um, systems that are going to really significantly impact all kinds of communities, that the more that those developments happen in conjunction uh, with various levels of community development, the better we are going to be to recognize um, and to deal with the political and ethical implications of data, uh, which are not only at the sort of stratosphere of philosophy or of federal policy, but are all the way down to municipalities and even smaller uh, to schools and uh, uh, to schools and jails and, uh, and universities. Thanks. Uh, so uh, maybe at this point we can pivot to audience questions. Uh, do we have a first question from Sam? Uh, hello, professors. It's great to see how far the course has come since the first <laughs> semester in which I was a student. Uh, where do you see LLMs fitting into the questions you discuss in the book and course? So Sam, it's first of all amazing to see you um and i i have to admit every uh so we have a lab once a week and every every week i seem to be ending uh with new material on uh on, on large language models and the significance of those whether it ranges from questions of interpretability um or to questions of the environmental cost of training these and thinking about the 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 the, the cost of creating ever ever greater ones who actually showing people how large language models um, can be developed. So we had students like, you know, I showed them how you would make a large language model that re reproduced Groot, the character from the Marvel universe. Um, so, uh, and, and then to think uh, uh, again, how is it that we think about this in terms of ethical and political terms? And I think a lot of the conversation um, it's sort of like an argument over whether you add a calculator to a third grade classroom. Um, I think that's not the way to think about the impact of large uh, uh, large language uh, models whatsoever. It's more important to think about them as neither good nor bad, um, but rather pieces of potential infrastructure that we are going to collectively build. And that infrastructure could be something that could be used to uplift lots of communities, or it could be like when highways were driven through communities without their input um, and, and you know, often severed them. It's here in the Bronx or in Atlanta and many other places. That, uh, that metaphor of an infrastructure, I think, is better to think about the complicated ramifications of these kinds of models as they get built into uh, our society. Society. I don't know. What more would you add, Chris? A couple of places where it touches on the on the book and the class. So uh, as Sam, I, I hope Sam was there when we were using Eliza as part of the lab. So we do use a chatbot in the lab. We, we show them Eliza. We show them the source code for uh, a chatbot that had no artificial, sorry, it was artificial intelligence without any machine learning, right? So uh, this early chatbot allows you to look at the source code and you can see that it's it creates an experience which is sort of uncanny, like you're talking to a person, but it's it's not at all a smart piece of technology. Um, so that is one way that it, it features into the class is to help students think through what is it that's weird about the chatbot that has nothing to do with data, right? It just has to do with the, the, the weirdness of interacting with uh, a piece of technology that was designed by somebody and we give it um, the illusion of agency and yet we need to remember that we don't um, we don't attribute causes and agency to the tech. We have to attribute causes and agency to the designers who created that piece of technology. The other thing is is that it I think it amplifies the story that the the book tells around the the fall and rise of artificial intelligence recast as machine learning. How difficult it was to create a world in which we created things we would call intelligence from rules, and how brittle and wrong the way we thought we think was, right? And in fact, it's much easier, we now know, given the scale of computation and data, to make artificially intelligent products, just setting aside for the minute the fact that we don't actually have a good definition of intelligence, from data, 
rather than from pools. So those are two ways that I think the the, the recent rise of LLMs fit into the the arc of the class. Yeah, we also you know we use the the we we show you know we talk about how reinforcement is learning is used to optimize the appearance of spontaneity. It's not an accident um, uh, at all. It is a, a product of the way that they are trained. Um, and, and so it serves as a wonderful example of that particular kind of learning. Thank you. The next question from Earl J. Wagner. As you mentioned, aggregating health data at a large scale has the potential to accelerate innovation, but with privacy concerns. How have notions of health data privacy changed over time? I think health data has been a really useful um, use case for helping people understand why privacy um, has ethical concerns, right? Yes. So when we say that something is unethical, we often just mean it's bad. Uh, but there's particular ways in which ethics and privacy are coupled under the, um, well, under one particular framework of understanding ethics. So we spent some time in the book talking about the battle for ethics over the last decade and the way that ethics was was framed as an applied field in the United States in the, six, in the 70s and 80s uh, via the Belmont Principles. So part of the idea of the Belmont Principles is to say that ethics is really about a tension between um, respect for persons benefits versus harms and justice. And justice includes oppression as well as fairness. So when people talk about privacy, they're often saying, well, privacy is bad because I didn't consent to have that thing uh, revealed about me. Or they talk about privacy as being bad because it causes me harm. Uh, but health data is one of those arenas which really sharpens the conversation. And in fact, a lot of our, our regulation in the last uh, 20 years was accelerated by people pointing out examples of how you could break privacy and re-identify people specifically using health data. So we spent some time on this example from Latanya Sweeney. Latanya Sweeney, now a, a professor at Harvard, at the time she was a graduate student at MIT, investigating how you could re-identify people from an allegedly anonymous uh, database or an allegedly anonymous table, meaning let's say that I give you a table of data and I strip out the column that has your name, but I leave in columns like your age and your zip code and your gender. Uh, and then I give you another table that um, has your, your gender and your zip code and your age and all of your health data, right? So clearly those, those three columns together form a join key that allows you to re-identify uh, somebody's or reassociate somebody's medical health records with their name. So um, there's a good story, which is often told, unfortunately, it's not true, but there's a good story often told that when she was a graduate student, she used this technique because she purchased some voter data for a few dollars and futures purchased some uh, health data for a few dollars and then mailed the governor of Massachusetts his own health record. So I, I've heard this story many times. I've seen it in print. I emailed Professor Sweeney. She said, unfortunately, it's not true, but it's a good, it's a good illustration. So, um, so health data has done a lot to sort of focus conversation because we can picture it. Like we understand what it's like to have that data exposed. Whereas when we think about, you know, data about me clicking on a few movie reviews, that doesn't seem so political, meaning it doesn't seem so charged with power. Uh, so yeah. health data, please. Oh, I was just going to say, it's also really useful for giving people a better intuitions of what is different when you have data at very large scale. Um, so often privacy conversations come back to individual sort of uh, in the wake of the Snowden revelations, you know, people in the federal government would say, well, it's only metadata, you know, the metadata of your phone calls, it doesn't reveal that much about mm -hmm. you. But of course, we all know that metadata at scale is profoundly, um, uh, it's pro both profoundly useful if you're in the national security state, it is powerful, um, and it is privacy violating. So it does, the health data brings home some of those challenges, but it also brings home the real challenge of the that there, there are key ethical and political choices that go along with technical choices. The more that we uh, anonymize that data through whatever technical measures, differential privacy, other sorts of things, we do lose a certain kind of utility. And those are concrete conversations that need to be had, not just by, um, say, medical researchers or data specialists, but by broader communities where there are, uh, there are in, in important questions that need to be uh, adjudicated. Genomics and DNA data has also really sharpened the conversation. So after, let's say, the late 90s, when people realized, golly, we're going to be able to sequence lots of organisms, and then we're going to be able to sequence lots of people, people realized, okay, well, that's 
fantastic because genotype to phenotype mapping would open up this possibility for understanding what genes or what genetic signatures are associated with different diseases. But if you think about it for a minute, that also raises the possibility of great harm. So um, health data are incredibly powerful, right? I mean, like clinically powerful as well as politically powerful, uh, but it's done a lot to sharpen our conversation and our regulation about how we, um, how we take care of people's data more generally. Yeah, that was going to be my question as well, uh, like in terms of aggregated data. And I wanted to hear your thoughts on uh, aggregated metadata and how concerning that is. But I think you've answered that. So, uh, well, uh, I guess uh, I, sh I need, uh, you know, it's uh, I, I perhaps we, maybe you could tell us a little bit about how long you worked on this book and how you worked together. I mean, Matt and I have known each other for a decade now. I, I got, I had the pleasure of hearing Matt give a talk on the history of machine learning ten years ago this spring at Columbia. Uh, Matt, remind me, how did we, how did we get this idea? So we were, uh, yeah, after we came to know each other, we uh, began teaching in a program in a journalism school, which was to bring tools of data analysis to young journalists who were really interested in. Uh, continuing the kind of uh, more traditional journalism they do, but be empowered by the ability to investigate things at scale, like SEC findings or uh, other, other kinds of things that might not be amenable to traditional methods. Um, and so in that program, we thought a lot about how is it we teach data tools without giving them a kind of techno solutionism, if though they, they were going to be the, sol sol the, the solution to all their problems. And I actually live in a Columbia dorm, and I have events with Columbia students, and, and Professor Wiggins right here came and spoke to them. And the students were like, oh, the two of you need to teach a class together. And uh, that was a wonderful initiative. And so we did. Uh, we came together and we got a little bit of funding. And the class was initially more focused on history. Um, but the students pressed us to ever more make it about you connecting that history with questions of uh, ethics and politics. And it, it changed gradually from a small seminar um, into a, a larger lecture course. And from that, we found we had articulated uh, you know, this long history um, that was connected to these very present questions um, that keep becoming present right now. We're faced very much with large language models. Um, uh, in, you know, 2016, it was Cambridge Analytica and, 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 and Facebook, and it will continue to be so. So the book emerged actually quite organically out of the kind of conversations we had from with students. And uh, I should say, from the various pushes the students uh, demanded, you know, pushed uh, they 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 pushed us to be clearer, to be um, to to give better examples. Uh, it, it's thoroughly born out of an educational context, um, and uh, the pleasure of uh, the two of us working together. Well, uh, I guess uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Wiggins and Dr. Jones, uh, for your exceptionally insightful talk. Uh, I would highly recommend the book to everyone watching. It's a fantastic read, and we can all get some takeaways from it. Uh, thank you so much again. Thank you, thank you so much for having us. Our pleasure. <laughs>